would like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Haruska. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Alliances and Marketing for Constellation for Health. Um, we are very excited to have everybody with us this morning. Uh, we've got two amazing healthcare experts, um, both from an operator and entrepreneur perspective, but also from a legal perspective. And um, we are calling here live from downtown Tampa at the uh, Florida's largest innovation hub in Bar Collective, which Constellation for Health is also a member. Uh, briefly going to touch on the agenda for this morning. Um, after I kick things off, we're going to pass it on to Saru, who's going to talk about our the inflection points in healthcare. Then we're going to pass it on to Rada, who's going to go over some of the top questions regarding the No Surprises Act. Then we're going to hand it back to Saru, talk about solutions that our company offers, and then I'll put a brief bow on things. And just to share very briefly at a high level, Constellation for Health is a healthcare innovator. Um, with a very simple but powerful mission, and that is to make a positive impact on patient outcomes. Uh, we have solutions both for healthcare insurance companies and healthcare providers. On the insurance company side, we have solutions from provider data management to provider network management to healthcare analytics. And for providers, we have a referral management platform that's really starting to gain some traction. And our clients span from a Fortune 150 payer all the way to a large Florida ophthalmologist practice. We have locations in sunny Tampa Bay, Florida, where we're based out of here today, and also in locations throughout the world, including Chennai, India. And we have many folks on the team and home offices all throughout the world. So a lot of people ask us, what does the four stand for in Constellation for Health? It's basically meant to um, convey who we serve. Obviously, patients are the ultimate person we're trying to deliver better outcomes for. And like I mentioned before, we offer solutions, providers and payers. And then last but not least, the partners that we work with are critical to our mission and what we do. And speaking of our partners, we are happy to have the trifecta of a partnership with Salesforce. We're both a consulting partner, ISV partner and app exchange partner. Um, we're very fortunate and proud to be a part of the Gartner ecosystem. And we leverage their healthcare analysts and all their amazing research. And last but not least, I want to point out visibility management. I believe their managing partner, Richard Sanchez, is with us this morning. Um, they've been incredible in helping us leverage and engage in the vision care industry. And without further ado, I'm very excited and honored to introduce our founder and CEO. Uh, Saru brings over 25 years of healthcare experience and entrepreneurship to the table. He's built many companies, exited companies. Uh, his last company, who's the leading IBM healthcare partner, he's worked with major healthcare providers and payers, including Maine the Blues. And on a personal note, he gives a lot to the community through scholarships. He mentors companies, invests in companies. I could spend all morning uh, raving about our CEO, but uh, I know you want to hear more of his expertise and hear me rave about him. So without further ado, Saru Shashardri. Uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, good morning and uh, good day, good evening to everyone um, throughout the world. Um, the, uh, I also want to thank you and Claire from our team uh, for putting this session together, uh, and I know how much you, effort you put into this. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just have to open up with uh, one particular thought. Um, as we get into the session about No Surprises Act, we actually have to introspect ourselves on why an act like No Surprises Act is necessitated. Um, if we had systems and processes that um, enable the healthcare consumer to be not surprised by unexpected expenses. We wouldn't need an NSA. So I just find it a little bit ironic that we have to have an NSA. Uh, so from a technologist, uh, technologist perspective, I don't want to talk about the broader systemic and political issues in our healthcare system. And as a technologist, my focus has been in how technology enabled the advent of NSA. And then in the future, how can we make it better for the healthcare consumer um, themselves, right? So, and the second context I wanna give as we go into the, the next slide, uh, if you can forward to the next slide, Rich, is uh, NSA itself has a, a broad set of impacts across the healthcare spectrum. Uh, but for today's session, within the context of this session, we'll be focusing on the payer community and within the payer uh, community, we'll be very focused on the payer provider relationship that gets impacted by NSA itself um, for time and efficiency. We do hope to bring other thought leadership sessions like this and discussing broader impacts of NSA and other things as well. But for today's session, we're focusing on the payer provider relationship. 
So to take a step back and kind of zoom out a little bit, what I always recommend to my clients, my C my CIOs and uh, CEO clients, is that when when something like NSA hits you, not to just be reactive to NSA, but kind of to zoom out a little bit and see how can you maximize the ROI through your response strategy for something like NSA. And from my perspective, uh, our clients, we recommend they ought to be aware of these four inflection points when they talk about NSA. On the one side, most of the payers are pushing to value-based care from vol volume to value is a trend and uh, a definitive thing to stay here. So more and more at-risk contracts are getting uh, created and awarded to the providers. So as part of that value-based system, there is an opportunity to uh, reinvent and reimagine the relationship. I do speak to a lot of providers on this aspect quite a bit. And one key thing they always point out is, sort of regardless of what uh, reimbursement model is put on me, I'm motivated to give the best care to the patient. So I want to make sure that the payers enable me to give the best care. And that's what I'm worried about uh, constantly, regardless of the reimbursement model. On the other side, they also say that uh, value-based care should not be pushed on us in such a way and cause more administrative burden and the tools and the experiences that the payers are giving uh, giving to us ought to be easy for us to use is another feedback I get from the provider side when we talk about solutions to the payers as well. So that's a key aspect to remember as a health plan when you're responding to the provider needs. I also see significant opportunities around CMS interoperability, having had experience in working in other industries, both as a vendor as well as a consumer of uh, things like you know, uh, Airbnb, Uber, and other things, significant strides have been made in those businesses in terms of consumer experience by focusing on integration and interoperability. And as you all know, healthcare has been lagging behind on interoperability. And CMS interoperability, I think, is giving us a little bit of a watershed moment, again, as a technologist, to create much more interoperable and collaborative systems to power better and newer experiences. So I'm excited by those opportunities. When I speak to the provider on the other side, what keeps you awake at night? They talk about, hey, I'm working harder and harder. Consolidation is happening in my world and newer models are getting pushed. And I see entrants like Amazon and Walmart and uh, newer retail hubs, uh, retail health hubs coming. And I'm already worried about my patient leakage due to all the inefficiencies that I'm facing. And my cost of acquisition of a patient is going up. So my competition is something that keeps me awake and I have to keep on responding to this ever-changing landscape. And even when I speak to Radha, she is going crazy with all the transactions that she has to deal with because of the, the ever-changing landscape uh, in, in the provider side. Uh, so that is driving a lot of the, the discussions as well. And we are already looking at how can, we, how can the health plan respond to the concerns of the provider a little bit better. And then obviously uh, the acts like NSA, CMS regulations, all those become compelling events for a health plan to respond to from an inflection point. So as you respond to NSA, our recommendation is to not just be reactive to specific clauses in NSA, but use this as a kind of one more event in your blueprint to add to your capabilities uh, that, you, that you want to build. That's our strong recommendation to our health plans, uh, health plan customers. Next slide, Rich, please. This will be a deja vu slide for many of my health plan customers and, and newer prospects as well. Uh, a lot of vendors have this, this, uh, this type of slides and internally working within health plans, I've had many of these versions of the slide. Um, so it's like a groundhog day. We have uh, fragmented systems, we have manual and archaic processes, poor data quality, siloed departments. These are all uh, uh, things that have been ongoing in health plans for many years. Um, but at the same time, each of these opportunities like NSA is going to give us the ability to reimagine certain things. So in this particular context, in this particular session, one area that we need to reimagine is how provider relationship is managed because NSA has implications on that. Um, about, uh, and as a transparently as a vendor, I got to say five years, four or five years ago, health plans are significantly interested in wanting to invest in reimagining the provider relationship management systems. But as vendors came up short in providing comprehensive solutions, they moved on to other compelling uh, needs as well. But I think now there's an opportunity to reimagine that and reinvest in provider relationship management systems and modernize the legacy network management systems 
is an opportunity that that NSA brings to the table. So as we go along this uh, this presentation and the session, after Radha speaks about the the legal implications of NSA, we'll come back and talk to you about what we are seeing in the market and how we are addressing some of these things from a solutions perspective. Uh, so with that kind of a, a broader uh, context, uh, I would like to invite uh, one of our esteemed advisor, Radha Bachman, to give her, her deeper insight into NSA. Um, I'm personally honored to have someone of the caliber of Radha in our advisory board. Uh, her bio is very long and I don't want to ingest to her, but she's, she's, she's a partner in Fisher Broils and represents a diverse array of healthcare entities. And she's one of only 100, 100 plus attorneys in the Florida area to be certified in health law by Florida Bar and uh, her expertise uh, extends uh, both state as well as federal healthcare regulatory matters. Uh, she's frequently sought after speaker and we are extremely thankful for her time and her insights uh, today. Uh, so thank you Radha and I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of give us your words of wisdom from a legal perspective and then perhaps I can follow it up with uh, some ideas on the solution side. Thanks so much, Saru. Thank you, Rich, too, for putting this together and inviting me to, to participate today. You know, I, I, I just want to say at the outset that I think Saru and his team were really visionaries as it relates to the Constellation 4 platform and the services to be provided, because I think our original conversation happened maybe like in 2018, 2019, before No Surprises Act. And so he really saw that this was going to be something that that culminated in probably a, a mandated requirement under the law. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in the next few slides. But, you know, I think I, I think his point is very well taken and that, you know, we shouldn't be reactionary. We should look at this in, as a, in a broader framework to see what other um, opportunities there are to implement a really seamless relationship between kind of the four big players, the constellation four players that, that can really move uh, healthcare forward. So next slide, Rich. So just a quick overview. Um, you know, I, I always think it's important to kind of set the stage of what we're looking at here in terms of the legislation. So uh, the No Surprises Act was signed into law in December 2020. It was part of the massive Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2011. Uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act is 2,124 pages. NSA is 180 pages of that. Um, so it's, it's and that's the, the law, right? So that's just, here's what we expect will be done. Um, the second part of that is actual implementation of regulations. How will it be done? Okay, we understand that this is the mandate, but how do we do it? How do we implement it? That's the rules. That's the regulations. And so there have been three interim final rules that have been adopted since the law was signed. One was in July 2021. That was 114 pages. One was September 2021. Uh, that was 163 pages. And in November 2021, that was 42 pages. So this is a, the, a dream of any lawyer. Um, give us a lot of things to, to dig into and to talk about and to work through. Um, You've read but, them all, right, Rada? You've read them yeah. all? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Um, but the reality is that we're not done yet. Um, we expect that CMS is going to issue a number of additional rules. And again, these are interim rules. So there are they're still accepting comments on a lot of these. So there will be a, a final rule that's issued for all of these plus additional interim final rules. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Another thing that's important to know about this particular act, the No Surprises Act, is that it, there are three federal agencies involved. Typically, on the healthcare side, when I'm looking at a CMS regulation, it's really HHS. That's that's the organization that's that's kind of running the show. HHS, CMS. Here we have Department of Labor, um, and HHS, and I and there's a uh, Department of Transportation. I believe is also involved. So there are three agencies that all have to be coordinated when they're issuing an interim final rule, which is probably why um, there is a delay in getting all the interim final rules out. And to Saru's point, the, the purpose of the No Surprises Act was really to try to, it, it's the end result of several prior bills that had been introduced that sought to address the surprise bill problem. Um, it's a consumer protection law. And so, and that's when you read it, you, you get that sense that really they're trying to kind of bridge the gap between all of these different players in healthcare to try to protect the consumer. So I think it's important to, to look at the requirements and the legislation with that 
framework um, because then you can kind of understand the public policy purposes behind it. Next slide, Rich. So one of the questions that first came to me from Saru is kind of what are the plans that are that are subject to NSA? Is it just Medicare Advantage plans because Medicare Advantage plans take dollars from the federal government? And the answer is no, it's it's much, much broader than that. Um, the term health plan under the No Surprises Act refers to group health plans, group and individual health insurance coverage offered by health insurance issuers and self-insured plans. Um, so what are some examples of this? Private employment-based group health plans that are subject to ERISA, those would be included. Non-federal governmental plans subject to the Public Health Service Act. Qualified church plans established and maintained for employees of tax-exempt churches. Um, federal employer health benefit plans are also covered. So what's not covered in that? Um, ex un there's an express exclusion for accepted benefits. So that's standalone dental or vision plans. If there's dental or vision offered as one of the defined plans, then it could be covered by NSA. But if it's a standalone dental or vision plan, it would not be covered. And it also excludes short-term limited duration plans. So just a quick question as you have the slide, would, uh, would a Medicare wraparound dental and vision plan come under this purview? If they are part of the Medicare plan, so if it's if it's Medicare fee for service, um, mm -hmm. it would not because Medicare right. is separately um, is separately governed. If it is a standalone plan that's purchased separate from your Medicare fee for service, then it also would not be subject to NSA. Thank you. Next slide, Rich. So one of the kind of key aspects of No Surprises Act is the concept of a dispute resolution process. And there are really two types of dispute resolution processes contemplated by the, by the No Surprises Act. There's the provider patient dispute resolution, and then there's the provider payer dispute resolution. And to Saru's point, we are not you know, this is a, a lengthy law. There's a lot of rules. We are focused mostly on what I would call Section 116 of No Surprises Act, which is really related to kind of the network um, and plan information uh, requirements. But one of the questions that does come up regularly is what, what is this dispute resolution process? What is what are the costs associated with it? How long is it going to take? And the reality is that, you know, I, I have some notes here in the slide, but Below it, I think, is probably the most important aspect of this, which is we have some interim final rules that talk about what the process looks like, but we expect that it will change. Um, you know, we've, we've already seen a significant pushback from a lot of state medical associations and providers generally in terms of how the provider payer dispute resolution process works and how the ultimate amount or charge can be determined. Um, but let me go a little bit deeper into these uh, options. So there's the provider patient dispute. So if if as part of NSA, providers are required to provide patients with a good faith estimate, if the if the ultimate charge that the patient receives exceeds $400 over the good faith estimate, then they can initiate a dispute resolution process to deal with that. Um, the the law requires that there be an administrative fee imposed for initiating that process. For 2022, that fee is $25. So it's not significant. And, and really the, the law actually says it cannot be, the fee that's imposed cannot be a barrier to pursuing the process. So $25 is reasonable, but they want people to have a little bit of skin in the game so they're not frivolously pursuing this, this process. Um, it is similarly a kind of a, a prevailing party concept. So again, if, if you're the prevailing party in the dispute, then you do not have to pay the $25. They actually, in the interim final rules, they have a provision that says, if you're able to settle the bill with the patient in advance of the final um, resolution coming out of the dispute resolution process, then basically you split it 50-50. You actually have to deduct $12.50 from your bill to incur that 50% that fee. Um, on the provider payer dispute resolution process, now this is a little bit more complicated. It's not just like, you know, here's a thousand dollars and we want to initiate the process because this, this process is 
also gov it's governed by this federal law, but it can also be governed by state law. And states have their own internal dispute resolution process to deal with provider payer issues. And so there's if it's a state that is going to rely on their own state's process, then their fees will also apply. So I think ACA's fees for this are like, depending on the, the amount at issue, it's like $75 an hour or something like that. But again, it is a prevailing party concept. So at the end of the day, whoever prevails in the, in the dispute will not have to pay um, the ultimate charges. Um, and, and again, I, you know, I, I say all this with a little bit of a grain of salt only because we do expect that there will be changes um, that come along as a result of the comment process. CMS has issued some guidance that says, look, we're proceeding with the process as we have it now, despite some legal challenges. Um, but we should keep an eye on it because I do anticipate that it will, that there will be some shifts in, in exactly how it functions. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned, we're really focused on Section 116 of the No Surprises Act, which talks about network maintenance and provider directory information. And the reason for this is because it's been determined that inaccurate information causes real consumer harm. Patients might show up at the wrong address or they can't make an appointment because of incorrect information, wrong phone numbers. There's you know providers who are listed as in network that are no longer in network, which is really driving a lot of this. Um, or they make an appointment or they try to get in touch with a provider who's not accepting new patients and they get frustrated. So again, kind of back to what I originally said, which is this is a consumer protection concept through and through. Um, the real crux of the issue is that, you know, if, if a plan member goes and sees a provider believing that the provider is in network and the network uh, plan information is not updated and actually that person or that provider is now out of network and they receive a surprise bill, then now we got to go through this whole process um, of potentially dispute resolution, et cetera. So it's, this is really the first line of defense. I mean, that's, I think that's the way the government is looking at it is look, if we can get our network information updated and keep it accurate, then we can avoid situations where we have to escalate the issue into a dispute resolution, whether it be patient provider or provider payer. And ultimately, those things might end up going together, right? Because the provider's in the middle and they may say, gosh, I got to fight with the patient on one hand, and now I got to go argue with the payer on the other hand. And, and to Saru's point, providers are already, you know, really constricted in terms of how much time and energy they have to devote to just patient care. Um, so to, to have to then be embroiled in dispute resolution with multiple patients and multiple payers, that could be that could be a detriment to everyone in the end. Um, and so there are really kind of four new tasks that are required under Section 116 of the No Surprises Act. There must be a public facing database and you must have a process to ensure the information is accurate and up to date. So that's kind of network maintenance of provider directory information is important. You have to launch a verification process to update provider director quarterly. So this is a 90 day requirement. Every 90 days, the plan has to make sure that the information is accurate. And then you need to implement a process to remove unverified providers on a quarterly basis. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit when we move to the next slide. Um, let's move to the next slide, Rich. So also executing an updated updating process. So if a provider notifies a plan that there's been a change, change in address, change in availability, change in providers, the plan has to have a process in place to, to update their information within two days of receiving that information. Um, if it, there is a change to a provider's network status, so if their contract terminates, uh, you know, by by time or affirmatively by either party, they have one day to update the, uh, the information in their, in their network. Um, and then I think the important thing to understand here is that there has to be a process in place. And I think there was always a requirement to maintain a directory um, and to keep it updated, but here the, the government is imposing a timeline, a really, frankly, a really strict timeline in terms of how quickly that needs to be updated and and it doesn't there's not a lot of leeway um, as we see it right now um 
going back to the last slide, we talked about the the network act, the network availability, and 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 removing people from the network if they're not verifying their information. And this is going to be a really interesting thing to see how the government is going to enforce that issue. Because remember, I mean, provide, like I said earlier, providers are busy. And if they don't get around to verifying their information and say it's 12 months, they, they don't verify their information and you remove those people from your plan list, then you, then there becomes a network adequacy issue. Is there enough, are there enough providers in the area to, to provide care to the number of members that you have? So, they haven't dictated exactly what the timing is there, but there will need to be a process in place. And really it, it's, it just requires a really strong partnership between the plan and the providers to ensure that that information is up to date to avoid a, a lapse in care, frankly. Um, I thought it was interesting. I'm sure Saru shared this before, but there is an actual study done by CMS state of California and in independent research journals that found that more than 40% of network provider information have incorrect directory information. Um, and that if you were to, if you were to look back over time and say, okay, you know, 12 months to notify us of any changes. And if you don't get back to us, then you're going to be removed from the list. Then almost 90% of providers would be removed from network plan information, which is really, again, goes back to the network adequacy issue. Next slide. So, you know, I'm talking all about these health plan requirements. You know, the health plan has to do this within one day and that within two days. And there are actually responsibilities on the provider too. They do have to notify um, the plan if there are any material changes, you know, one through four kind of, you know, here, here are situations where you need to notify. And then number five is my favorite at any other time determined appropriate by the provider facility or HHS. Um, and so we can just ignore that one because that one's never going to happen unless uh, there are rules that are adopted that specifically identify what those situations are. Um, but there are requirements on on the providers too. now again, getting getting their their buy in. Um, and understanding the importance of this is, is going to be interesting, especially as it relates to enforcement. Um, because again, there is a, there's still a question about who, which, which entity, which, whether it's state or federal is required to enforce this. And what does enforcement look like? Um, is it, is it a financial issue consequence? Um, is it, or is it something else? And we don't know yet because the reality is they haven't issued an interim final rule to address section 116 yet. It was anticipated to be issued before January, January 1, 2022, which is when the this provision went into effect, but we haven't seen it yet and it's now April 13th. So hopefully it will come out soon. Uh, CMS did issue in some guidance that you know they're working on their rulemaking, but until then health plans are expected to implement the requirements using a good faith, reasonable interpretation of the statute. Again, there is a requirement that you comply but how is enforcement going to look? That's still to be determined. And next slide. We have, I don't know if you've seen in the comments, Rada, oh. thank you for that, by the way. Um, I'm yeah. amazed by how well you keep up with all the statutes and the evol evolving legislation and, you know, advising all the customers you have. So thank you for that. That was incredible. Um, we have a couple of questions from Ragu. I don't know if you could see them in the chat or if you wanted me to kind of yeah, I can see them. So the first one is, does NSA protect members from providers balance billing them on emergency care services? So there there are specific rules as it relates to emergency care and how and actually there's responsibilities on plans to define um, what emergency care looks like and how they're going to handle it. Um, that's really one of the areas where there has that has caused NSA to be uh, implemented is is emergency care, anesthesia care, um, where you go in, you think you're in an in-network facility, and then all of a sudden you find out your emergency doctors or your anesthesia doctors are out of network and you get that you get that surprise bill. So obviously in that situation, there can't be a good faith estimate issued, um, but there are, there are items in NSA that protect patients against emergency balance billing and, and out of network uh, costs. 
Um, can providers force members to waive NSA? If no, then can providers deny services if the member does not sign the waiver? Uh, that's an interesting question. So at the end of the day, providers do have the ability, generally speaking, to decide which individuals they want to treat and not treat, right? I mean, that that's, that's kind of autonomy that's provided to a prior, provider at any time. Um, I have not seen anything that, that says that um, what would happen in the event that a provider forced somebody to waive the NSA requirements. I don't believe that you are permitted. This is a, a, a legal federal requirement. Um, and so really you can't, you, it is on the provider to comply. So I, I'm not really sure how they could waive um, compliance. I guess they could say we don't want a good faith estimate. And there are certain, we're not talking in detail about good faith estimates today, but there are certain circumstances where a good faith estimate does not have to be provided. Um, but that would have to be in in accordance with how the law reads on the GFE requirements. Um, does the NSA force healthcare payers to maintain a log or record of how many NSA violations they were involved in for members to review the payer's track record? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure actually whether that information is gonna be made public, uh, meaning is there gonna be some kind of public database where you can search and see how many dispute resolution uh, processes the payer or the provider has gone through, whether with the patient or with a payer? Um, I, I would guess the answer is no. Uh, but I don't know whether that is something that they have um, have determined yet again, because, you know, they're still implementing the rules to, to implement the, the law itself at this point. But great questions. Great. Thank you again, Ragu, for those questions. And we're going to kind of wrap up our webinar today. Of course, no webinar would be complete without going over briefly some of our product and solutions. So you can kind of weave all this together and how the constellations fit into this uh big picture plan. So I'm going to turn it back to Saru. Thank you again, Radha. Yeah, again, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Radha. I mean, this was just power packed. I, I learned some new things, Radha, that I didn't know myself. <laughs> and then uh, just to touch on, on a personal emotional side, some of you know that uh, I was admitted to the hospital due to COVID uh, last year in January, and I stayed in the hospital for seven days. And uh, I did get two surprise bills. One of them was, uh, one of it was uh, $750. The other one was like, 800 something. Um, fortunately, I could afford to pay it. And at that time, NSA wasn't the effect. Uh, even then, I, I don't know if I would have filed something. But this is real and this happens. And uh, this is a constant um, a reminder for us. Another another um, uh, JMA study that I looked at, uh, especially for uh, childbirth and pregnancy, the surprise bill average is actually $2,000 or more. Uh, so you can imagine how much uh, a burden uh, a family will get hit with these types of surprise bills. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, I always learn a lot of stuff whenever I speak to you. Uh, Rich, if you can go to the next slide. So the couple of takeaways I had from previous discussion, Radha, and her coaching and guidance, as well as this session, you can see how important data plays a role um, and she mentioned the CMS study that found actually uh, the, the provider directories are incorrect. We actually have uh, analyzed that uh, audit in 2018 uh, uh, pretty deeply. Uh, the actual number is around 52% of provider directories are inefficient or in, uh, deficient or inaccurate. And they actually sent non-compliance letters to 98% of the plans that are audited. Um, so that is a pretty uh, significant size. And one other thing that Radha mentioned, what happens if the providers are removed from the network or required to be removed from the network for not verifying their information, not only from a network adequacy perspective, but also look at it from provider satisfaction perspective. They went through so much to get contacted and contracted and credentialed, and we all know how long and how painful credentialing process is. And then suddenly, just because they couldn't respond to a verification request, they're taken off the network. That'll be a, a significant uh, damage to the payer provider relationship. So one quote uh, that I want to quote from our partners in Gartner, um, they actually published and they've actually updated this significantly is that they're seeing a significant investment from health plans on um, data and data analytics 
but they see significant gaps in data preparation and curation. And this is a, a root cause for NSA itself. Because the data quality is bad, and in fact, I have a quote that people attribute to where I say, the shirt that I'm wearing has better data quality in the supply chain systems between the retailers and, and the manufacturers than provided data within the healthcare systems that we use. So that data and data curation, data quality is a significant challenge. That's one of the root causes of many things that led to NSA. So I think this is an underpinning of the solution that you have to reimagine uh, to address NSA, to respond to NSA, as well as other things that we've been talking about in the session. Next slide, please. So I would like to kind of give a, a, a three-pronged approach to the response strategy when, the, when it comes to the payer provider uh, response by the health plan. Uh, I would say first, you should really tackle your provider data management uh, systems and processes today and ensure that end-to-end, -end, it's not just a point-in-time problem anymore. In the past, I've seen health plans say, oh, I'm gonna clean up my directory, I'll do it in January, or I'll do it just before open enrollment, and then I'm done and then rest of the year, they don't do anything about it. So they have to have a robust provider data management strategy, and we'll talk about some, some best practices around this as we go along. And second is, as Radha said, there is a requirement to have provider network verification processes in place, but not just verifying. We know that most health plans send out these verification emails, verification letters, and verification phone calls, but you have to have a, a follow-up process around verification and make sure that once verification happens, what are the subsequent streamlined processes that you need to have to respond to the verification as well? We'll talk about that as well. And then finally, I believe that this is again a watershed moment for the payers to relook at the provider relationship management. And as Radha uh, very pointedly uh, pointed out that the provider is now in the middle, they can get a dispute through the patient. Just for $25, somebody can open up a dispute and imagine there's a flood of disputes that the providers have to deal with, and then it is attributed to something bad that the health plan did that caused the provider to have these disputes. That's again a, a bad provider side issue that a uh, health plan needs to address, but let's get ahead of the problem by reimagining the provider relationship is what our recommendation to our clients are. So robust provider data management, provider network verification, opportunity to reimagine provider relationship, or I would say are the three, three legs to the stool in terms of your response strategy. So how can we do that in terms of our solutions that we can bring to the table is what the next slides are about. If you can move to the next slide, Rich, please. So the first thing is around provider data management. So we have a comprehensive provider data management platform that we are illustrating here. The, the technology design behind it is extremely complex and I'm doing this service to my technical architects and solid team of developers who have built the solution. So on our platform, we have a curation engine that aggregates data from multiple sources, both public and private, and uh, consumes this data, catalogs it, reconciles it, and from uh, various perspectives is able to detect anomalies and create a curated version of truth about the provider. This then we are able to verify through various means including making the, the provider verify the data as well as through phone calls to the provider's office, just like a member would uh, uh, seek an appointment to helping with the roster management and things like that. We then say, okay, is this information about the provider actually verified from our perspective as opposed to just curated? Then once it is verified, we're able to syndicate that information to various health plans in terms of verified networks. Now, there are lots of data subscription solutions available in the market. We frankly believe that our solution is better just in terms of giving this verified network because we also have dedicated verification capabilities that we can tailor for health plans um, in this regard. But on top of that, we believe that just giving clean data is not sufficient for provider data management. We have to help the health plan proactively address the anomalies and the discrepancies between what is the public version of the truth and their private version of the truth and help them build the system of truth and keep it consistent all throughout the year. And for that, we have change management solutions in the form of data analytics tools that can probe the systems of truth inside the four walls of the health plans, give clean dashboards 
and change management recommendations to synchronize the data between our verification processes and the internal processes, and then implement secondary verification processes, including perhaps even field service people verifying the information as well in the back end. So that end-to-end -end process is what you need to implement. Whether it's our solution or not, the end-to-end -end process is extremely important uh, for provider data management. Now, a lot of your process inefficiencies can get fixed if you have a robust provider data management, as opposed to just trying to automate a bad process, implement a good process driven by solid data. That is our recommendation, and this solution from us uh, will enable you to definitely go in the right, right direction for now and the future as well. So once you have done this provided data management, how do you do provider network verification is part of our platform as well. Next slide, please. Again, the technology behind this is very complex. Uh, it runs on Amazon Web Services and integrates uh, a lot of intelligent tools from like Amazon Connect and our own proprietary technologies. So network verification, as Radha said, is a key requirement of this act. And then keeping that verified information auditable and uh, uh, you know, uh, from a compliance perspective, when it comes to dispute, you, are, you have to demonstrate that you did verify this information or made an attempt to verify that information. And if the response didn't come back, you took certain follow-up actions and those follow-up actions can be documented and you can provide a history of all these verifications as part of the dispute resolution as well. So proactively, again, allowing you to track this network verification request documenting them and being able to give you dashboards and information and not only give you clean data after this verification, but also help you respond with the verifications uh, uh, downstream processes. Because some of this verification could result in complex downstream process. Radha deals with a lot of acquisitions and she deals with a lot of consolidation transactions that are happening in the provider world. So what happens if a practice is bought and the group name changes and uh, a provider retires as part of that, and a new provider comes in, that could trigger a recredentialing and a recontracting process. So a network verification could result in a subsequent process that you may not be aware of. We have caught during network verification real time many cases where the practice got acquired, the practice logo changed, the practice um, uh, FEIN changed, and the brand name changed, but the health plan did not know about it because it's just two, three days old transaction. But the transfer of control has already happened. So these types of things have to be taken care of in your network verification process as well. And we help you implement these uh, things in, with, as part of our solution. Then the next slide is, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Rich. So yes, you can tactically respond with the provider data management and provider network verification solution. And that's what the, the middle pillar demonstrates, implement our provider data management solution so you can respond to NSA. But is there a broader opportunity? Because most of the health plans that we see is that um, the provider experience that they're implementing begins after the provider is contracted. And then they use ad hoc processes to maintain the provider information. And more or less the provider portals that we've seen deals with contracted provider being able to do pre-authorizations and claim submission and claim statuses and things like that. But the life of a provider begins much earlier than that when, it, when they're interacting with the payer and then continues beyond just claim submission and prioritization in terms of recredentialing, recontracting, and renegotiations and things like that. So we recommend looking at this end-to-end -end life cycle as a holistic viewpoint of provider network management and using Salesforce as our partner and Salesforce Health Cloud we built significant tools on top of their capabilities in health cloud and provider network management for our solution to become that system of truth and the ability to manage the entire provider life cycle from what we call as contact to contract and then recredentialing. So contact to contract, we see companies of health plans have not invested. They use uh, spreadsheets, they use manual processes. It's all siloed departments from recruiting to credentialing to to configuration, and then beyond that, uh, provider relationship seen as a in-contract uh, provider relationship only. And so there's no end-to-end -end holistic approach to this provider network management that we've seen in most health plans. So together, provider network management capabilities, the provider data management capabilities that we have, and then the healthcare analytics accelerators that we give you to manage your change management process and keep this data clean 
and power all your modern processes in Salesforce Health Cloud. And giving this digital experience to the providers is what we see as the, as Gartner calls it, the multi-experience platform that you want to give to the providers. So think of yourself as a consumer, what is what an enriching experience you get with vendors that you interact with today, the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the, the Amazons of the world. How can we as a health plan give a similar experience to our provider community, which is a, a significant value uh, part of your uh, operations and your service to your members, your provider network is your significant asset. So that's what we are calling for as an opportunity to reimagine this experience through this multi-experience platform powered by this clean data, enriched by healthcare analytics. That's the end-to-end -end solution we're talking about as a broader NSA strategy. So next slide, please, Rich. So we have some, uh, uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding, so we can talk about the, the case studies and I won't go into a lot of details here. A combination of the three pillars that I spoke about, healthcare analytics, provider data management, and reimagining the provider lifecycle has already, even with some of the uh, smaller deployments that we've done, has significant ROI already with, with our health plan customers and one health plan within a matter of days. In fact, I, I recall within a matter of 60 to 70 days, we were able to find a million dollars in savings in the bottom line. That is straight to the bottom line that we found through the provider data analytics that we were able to do through our accelerators. And that was that was immediately identified because there was some underbilling and, and pass-through expenses that are not getting covered based on the tools that we deployed. Our uh, record for improving the provider data accuracy is around the 92% mark. The other 8% is actually the fluidity in the market for, uh, that people like Radha deal with in terms of the transaction they're dealing with, the consolidation, the acquisition that's happening, and the churn that's happening in the provider networks is keeping that 8% uh, accuracy there um, relevant, um, as opposed to the industry standard of 52% uh, inaccuracy. Uh, accuracy. Um, we, we have concrete data where our business users have come back and said that through the work that we did, they're able to do certain things on provider relationship management that used to take eight hours for them. They're able to do within a matter of minutes, uh, in fact, and, and we were generous and we said half an hour so we, we, we've achieved early, actually already 90% productivity. And this customer is a reference customer and they're happy to take calls on our behalf if you want to talk further about how we helped um, they, them uh, progress in their life cycle. So go to the next slide, please, uh, Rich. So to kind of wrap up, uh, Radha talked about the regulations and the section uh, that pertains to provider network management and health plans. Uh, she clearly highlighted what a health plan is responsible for and what the providers are responsible for. And to our customers, if you take that as a broader context, and as you as you go through your response strategies, again, I would like to recap with these three things. One is provider data management is an end-to-end -end problem, not just a point-in-time problem. You need to have comprehensive processes to implement it end-to-end. -end. And our tools and solutions will help you with that. But again, whether you use our tools or not, you are to consider robust provider data management as part of your NSA response strategy. Provider network verification, beyond just the verification, you need to have a, a, a robust secondary verification and audit processes. And as part of that, you need to look at the provider life cycle that you're managing within your network and implement a, 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 a holistic provider network verification process or second recommendation. And then finally, use this as a, a launch pad to reimagine this whole contact to contract to renewal life cycle, just like the consumer expenses we take for granted in other industries. There is an opportunity to reimagine the provider relationship and technologies and tools and vendors like us are available now for you to consider. So this will be my three pronged strategy for uh, NSA response if I was on the health plan side and happy to partner with any health plan um, that is exploring these things and give our um, uh, experiences and battle scars on how they can build their response strategy. And thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Radha, for your excellent insight as well. Awesome, thank you, Saru. So we're actually gonna conclude a few minutes early so everybody can get a few minutes back in their day. 
but can't thank everybody enough. I'm sure there's a lot of questions because this was jam packed. And as you could tell, Saru and Radha can do this all day. They're definitely deeply passionate and experts in this subject. So for any further questions or chats or just want to bounce ideas or how do you further navigate this or I have a specific thing I need to respond to, Saru would be available for a free assessment to just, you know, have a conversation with you, um, more conversational than sales. That's not his DNA. Um, so, and I, I can't thank enough. I know we've thanked through, we've thanked Rada, we've thanked, you know, Claire for her efforts too, but a lot of the visuals and illustrations you saw are the end result of our incredible product development team. We've got amazing developers and programmers and talent all throughout the world. And they're working around the clock to develop our products and can't thank them enough because they're the behind the scenes engine that make all the good we do come to fruition. Um, and last but not least, just want to share our contact information and I'll actually put my email in the chat as well. So you can contact me directly for anything else that you need. And I think that's a wrap. Unless Rada, sir, you had any last final pearls of wisdom or Rada, you need to get back to reading those 2,000 pages of legislation. Right? Any, any final comments on your guys' end? Nothing else from me. Thank you again for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you so much for joining us today. And, hey, I'm recording, and this will be sent out to everybody within the next couple of days. Thank you, thank and you. appreciate your time. Thank you all. Have a great day.